it's real estate, but these are businesses, right? An apartment building has income, has employees, has expenses, and any business needs a plan. Welcome to the Freedom Point Real Estate Podcast, where we talk about creating more time freedom through passive real estate investing. Passive investing in real estate challenges conventional investment wisdom. We are passionate about learning and sharing resources with others who are ready to transform their investing mindset. Quick disclaimer as always, I am not a CPA, I am not an attorney or a financial advisor. This is not financial advice, not telling you or anyone else what to do. The views and opinions expressed in these podcasts are provided for education and informational purposes only and are not necessarily the views of my employer, ADP. I'm glad you're here. Now let's dig in. All right, welcome back Freedom Point podcast listeners. Thank you again for jumping into another episode of the Freedom Point I'm so glad you're here with us today. I'm your host, Jeremy Dyer, and I have an amazing guest with me today, Matt Bronner. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. Glad to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm really excited to have Matt on the show today. Um, I've known Matt for a few years now. Uh, Matt is the or one of the co-founders and principals of Endurance Capital, uh, which I've had the pleasure of personally investing into several of their uh, real estate syndications over the years. So the purpose of me having Matt on on the uh, on the podcast today is really to talk specifically about the topic of underwriting and pro formas and maybe some of the due diligence that they personally go through or that Matt goes through in the process of underwriting whether or not it makes sense to invest into a deal and to bring an opportunity uh, to their investor base. So again, really appreciate you being here with on the show uh, today, Matt. Um, just to kind of dive right into it, would love to maybe have you. Uh, get me caught up a little bit more on, you know, what you're currently focused on, um, you know, maybe even your real estate investing uh, journey as well. Absolutely. Well, I can tell you what I'm currently focused on, giving you guys a little bit of insight into uh, the physical background that you see here. Uh, based in the Twin Cities, along with Jeremy and the two other partners of Endurance Capital, Todd Dexheimer and Drew Whitson. I live on some land up north of the city, and we're in the process of building a home. And there's this old airplane hangar that I now use as an office. So for anyone who's watching this on YouTube, you're, you're seeing my life over my right-hand shoulder. It's kind of a weird thing to see your life all boxed up like that. And this airplane hangar used to have some really cool tools. I've got four kids like Jeremy, and now it's just got a bunch of bikes and toys and basketballs. Under my real estate journey, I tell people, I wish I could say that I went through this very diligent process that I was so smart and that I was able to identify multifamily real estate, buy and hold value add strategies that I just had this game plan that I was going to run in with. But that's just not the way my journey started. So everything I've done in real estate has been with uh, partners, Minnesota Capital Management, and that's what makes up Endurance Capital. It's MCM, Todd, and Drew. We started buying a townhome in 2011. We did no underwriting. There was no model. It was purely based off the gut feeling that, look, these things are selling for half of what their replacement cost is. There's got to be some value in this we got to be able to cash flow this, I think. And so we bought one townhome. We did everything ourselves. We painted it. We used to take votes on whether or not to accept a tenant. Uh, I've told people I've done every job there is when it comes to rental real estate. I have plunged toilets. I have fixed anything that you can imagine. It's amazing what tenants can break. Uh, and then I've done showings as well. And that's all we thought you could ever do. And we just kept doing that. We kept buying more townhomes. This idea of buying multifamily syndication, totally foreign to us. In fact, the first time we were a part of one in the Twin Cities was 2016. And we had questions as to whether or not it was legal. We're like, what? Like who goes on title? How does this all work? Because our model is everything's got to be integrated. We have to do everything ourselves here. And we were really fortunate that uh, we were able to buy into some deals where there was a trusted sponsor that executed a good business plan. And we were able to refinance into some good permanent uh, agency debt, got all of our money back in one instance, plus 30%. It was what what just happened here? And so we started to do more of that. And then along the way, I quit my job. We've experimented in some other markets as well. Uh, for those of you listening, the Twin Cities, there's good suburbs, but uh, the cities themselves, you're 
kind of an evil guy right now if you want to enforce a lease and collect rent, which had us looking into other markets. And I think that's a really important part as we talk about underwriting. And it's a small world of people who buy and trade apartment buildings. So along the way, that's how I was blessed enough to meet Jeremy, meet uh, Todd and Drew. And here we are now where we've got assets in Memphis. We've been really active. We like the Midwest a lot. So Louisville, Lexington, Columbus, Cincinnati, that area. And we're, we're trying to do more, not in St. Paul and Minneapolis proper, but in a lot of the suburbs around there. Yeah. Thank you for bringing the audience up to speed a little bit there on your, on your background um, as well. And I know you wear a lot of hats, you know, on the Endurance Capital team, but one of those uh, big hats that you wear is on the underwriting side. And so I'd like for you to talk to my listening audience a little bit more about, you know, what is underwriting and specifically as it relates to multifamily real estate and why it's so crucial for successful investments. Sure. You know, I think it's important for somebody who's probably maybe just getting started, right? Like there's this idea in real estate that you buy a house or you buy a piece of property and it just goes up, right? Like, okay, it looks nice. Somebody else is going to want this. Um, The fact of the matter is when you focus on what Jeremy and I have, which is multifamily apartment investing, it's real estate, but these are businesses, right? An apartment building has income, has employees, has expenses, and any business needs a plan in terms of how you are going to drive value. The most valuable part of any real estate, and I tell our acquisitions director this quite a bit, is it's not the land. It's it's the people. It's the leases. Because what we're looking for is how do we increase cash flow? At the end of the day, pure and simple, it's where can we come in uh, and increase cash flow? And you'll see a lot of people who automatically go to, oh, you've got to do a bunch of renovations uh, and that's how you can increase rents. And that's certainly a part of it, but real estate is really varied. And so uh, there's a number of ways to go about that. But underwriting is you're looking at a property and you're starting out nuts and bolts. Okay, what are the in-place incomes? What are the in-place expenses? How are they going to change? And then how am I going to create value? And if anyone's investing with another sponsor, it's that question that I think is super, super important because what makes our business so unique is there's a number of ways to create value. Maybe you're able to put on a different type of debt that can increase the cash flow. Maybe you can come in with a different type of equity structure that can increase the cash flow. Maybe you can, like we talked about, implement a strategy where you say, gosh, I think I can renovate these units and I can get more in rent for them. Or maybe there's just good, solid management practices. Like there has been delinquent efforts to collect rent there, right? Like there needs to be a coherent business plan in that regard. And I think that's a really important question for people to look into in terms of how this, and we can talk all you want about models, but how that sponsor is going to create value, because that's ultimately what you need to evaluate is how effective have they been with that approach in the past. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting that you brought up a couple of key points there. You know, number one, when you invest into a real estate syndication, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a multifamily uh, apartment building or, or complex or community of buildings, the reality is, is there's all kinds of different, you know, asset classes and really a lot of the underlying underwriting principles really remain the same um, outside of just, you know, one specific asset class. But um, can you speak specifically about the the topics of, of debt, expenses, renovations, delinquencies? I would assume that those are all kind of key metrics that you use when prioritizing your underwriting process for multifamily deals. Are there any other key metrics that you typically tend to uh, hone in on? We can go into more detail on each of those. I think all of those are always driven by the location, right? And again, real estate is incredibly varied. It's hyper local, which means it's hyper inefficient. Um, So multifamily properties can operate differently within the the same market. And again, that's what creates value there. So you want to make sure that whatever you're underwriting for, and when I talk about the location, I'm talking about population dynamics. Maybe uh, there's new employment coming into that area. Uh, For as many counties as we have in the United States, there's that many ways 
to uh, understand property taxes. And that's going to be one of your most significant expenses uh, that you need to be able to understand and appreciate. In terms of how you go about building, like we can just go uh, top down. Uh, I think you always have to be able to come back to kind of some common sense questions. Uh, It always sticks out to me that the more I see people grow in multifamily and as investors, the more basic their questions become, right? So if you look at really sophisticated family offices and institutional equity, you know, if they're looking at, okay, let's start out with income. You think you can get more. Why? Tell me a coherent reason. Like what, what's going to increase this? No one can come in on day one and just start handing out higher rent bills and going to collect that. Tell me what specifically is going to change here. And then also show me how everything operates within a comp set. You'll find in real estate, as we underwrite, we're always trying to index ourselves to what's around us, right? And so we're looking at, okay, who are the other similar properties? My customers are my residents here. Where else can they go and find a place to live? Because that's the product that I offer. And and how am I indexed appropriately uh, to them? It's It's a big red flag if anyone comes out and says, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reset the market. I'm going to go get rents that no one else has proven possible. Not saying that's never going to happen, but wow, I, I don't know how you're quite going to get there. And then as we move down, as you're looking at uh, your expense structure that's in place there, a, a property has its own characteristics based on when it was built. Its own characteristics bring its own expense structures. Things break in real estate. They're not going to stop breaking just because you have a new owner here. And so you you need to assume that past performance is going to indicate future performance on the expense side. And then if you really uh, want to be want to get serious about multifamily investing and you're digging into a pro forma on the expense side what you really really want to dig into are insurance and taxes. Uh, the fact of the matter is commercial property is how a lot of our uh, municipalities finance themselves. And so they are going out day one in some regards, like you want to invest down in Texas, you're never going to hide a sale from the county assessor there. So you want to understand what your tax liability is going to be day one and something your lender is looking at too. And then it's insurance. Right now, obviously, as it's gotten more expensive to build things, I have to tell people a lot of times, insurance companies are companies. They're designed to make money. So if there's a loss and now they've got to rebuild something at a much higher cost, well, they're going to make sure that they're protected there. And insurance companies have paid out a lot of losses for different reasons. Some of their investment portfolios have done much worse. But the fact of the matter is, you know, across, you know, whether you're talking California, Texas, Florida, some of those areas are seeing premium premiums that are going up 100, 200%. Like we're, we're seeing 20% increases. So making sure your sponsor has those allocated for are super important. Uh, and then we can talk on debt too, but I, I know it's a lot of information. So I'll pause there. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I know there's a few different terms that sponsors will tend to kind of throw out, you know, in their investor presentations and on maybe on their pitch deck, you know, terms like the loss to lease, deferred maintenance, uh, debt service coverage ratio or DSCR. Would you mind maybe kind of unpacking a little bit more about, you know, what those terms are and why they're important? Yeah, let's start at the end there because uh, I think there's a good mindset to have around it. So DSCR is debt service coverage ratio, which is really asking how much margin do you have in this budget, in this business plan here? And you're looking at that based on the net operating income. So what is inherently produced after units are rented and there's expenses, uh, what is left over to pay the debt? If it's one-to-one, meaning my mortgage is $50,000 a month and I've only got $50,000 in net operating income, I don't have a whole lot of margin. And anyone who's ever run a small business knows that stuff happens. Things come up. And so you'll see that most lenders want to see 1.25. So that means they want to see their mortgage payment, (coughs) excuse me, plus 25% there. And I, I offer all these, not never condemn, but because I've learned a lot of lessons the hard way. As we look at deals now, that's pretty light right? Like we want to see coming in, unless it's a really heavy value add where you're going to be doing um, some significant renovations to the project, you want to be right around one five there. And then as you really implement a business plan, you want to be pushing towards uh, 2.0. And then I I think you mentioned earlier, loss to lease. And what was the other one? Um, Deferred maintenance. 
deferred maintenance. Um, well, let's say I'm going to go back to deferred maintenance and let's come back to loss to lease because I think it is important. Deferred maintenance can mean, okay, I can continue to operate the property as it is. I can turn a unit, which means one tenant moved out and I can go patch some holes and clean it up and I can get it ready for the next tenant. But over time, as anyone who's known, known a home, there's a reason that the government allows us to take depreciation. It's because properties really do degrade over time. You're going to have to replace a furnace or an HVAC unit or a boiler or a chiller, right? You're, you're going to have to replace a roof. And so you want to think about that as a couple of ways. One, we all know that those are significant expenses. So as you're looking at opportunities where you know that that might be in place, there, you want to make sure that no one's ever making the assumption they're going to do that out of cash flow, right? That people have reserves that are proactively set aside. And then frankly, you're, you're funding the next round of reserves there as well. And it's important to understand that because to kind of link the two together, debt service coverage ratio, that's good, but there can still be expenses that we'd say that happen below the line, right? There, there still may be cash going out the door for some of these deferred maintenance items. And at the end of the day, there's nothing special about real estate. It's still dollars in and dollars out. And then loss to lease, if you're kind of going back up to the income side there, uh, if you're like me, a lot of this was foreign when I just started renting out single family homes. I'm like, the rent's the rent. What a loss to lease, a delinquency, vacancy, how does this all? Well, you're always looking to assess the health. If you've got a larger complex, like, okay, I've proven that I can sign leases at $1,200 a month. But then in the case of lost to lease, maybe I've got people, because again, this is why you have to be careful as you make income assumptions. When I buy a piece of property, I have to honor those leases, right? So maybe I've got a tenant that signed a lease a few months before we closed at $1,000 per month. So in our example, there is a loss to lease because the true market value for that unit is $1,200 a month, but I've got a lease on it for 1000 I I can't just change that because it's under market, right? So I have $200 there. Now, we like that because that helps tell the story. These are, these are complex businesses, multifamily properties. And you can then see like, all right, as I'm watching my top line income, is that growing over time? Is, and we look for that. You want to be part of vectors. You want population growth. You want job growth. You want rent growth to be increasing for the whole area, right? It's a, a rising tide that lifts all boats there. And then you want to be able to see, okay, how's my staff doing at bringing all my existing residents up to market there? And more money is, is good, obviously. These are cash flowing businesses that we need to pursue. But we, we look at that too, because expenses rise, especially as we've experienced the last 18 months. And that's what's needed to keep the property healthy. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Good, good explanations of deferred maintenance and lost to lease and the, the DSCR. They're all really important, I think, for investors to really understand, you know, not just what they mean in principle, but in fact, how the actual operator themselves are going to maximize, you know, the DSCR, you know, how they plan to burn off the loss to lease and really through the value add renovations of the, of the units, you know, how they plan to decrease that deferred maintenance. So uh, really appreciate your explanations there. Um, question for you then would be Matt, um, have you, uh, what are some maybe common pitfalls or challenges in underwriting multifamily deals and how specifically maybe do you overcome them? Well, I think it always goes back to execution. You can see an opportunity. And so we'll start there. Uh, in terms of somebody having a business plan, they're going to raise rents, right? It may be possible, but if it was just easy to push a button and rents would go up, then everybody would do it, right? And so assuming that that can happen quickly uh, can get you in a lot of trouble. Uh, you can misunderstand your expense structure. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot that we can dig into on the model. I'm a, I'm a big believer that the jockey in this business is the most important piece. Um, underwriting is, is what I do day in and day out. Um, there's a quote, though, by Dwight Eisenhower that I like, and I don't want to compare anything of what we're doing to war, but uh, Dwight Eisenhower said, there's nothing more important before the battle than the battle plan, right? After the battle starts, you rip up the battle plan. There's nothing more important to the deal than the underwriting. 
But after you close, the underwriting is irrelevant because these are dynamic businesses. And so I, I think as I'm processing your question here, uh, I've seen people get into trouble and I, I've experienced it myself. When you are trying to execute and implement a business plan that you don't have experience with. So as you're looking at investment opportunities, that's what I would kind of go back to is, okay, does this sponsor have experience with this business plan in this market with this product type? And we can get really into the weeds there, but it's your ability to understand the dynamics of a businesses that changes day to day that I think is going to be so important. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Matt, what role does tenant quality and occupancy rates play into the underwriting process? I think tenant quality is an important, probably the most important thing to be mindful of. And it may sound funny, but we actually work really hard to to say resident. And I'm not a guy who does a whole lot of PC stuff, but I, I think it's helpful to think of these people are our customers, right? I am going to ask them to pay a significant amount of money. People who, who tend who rent, there are renters by choice, but this is probably the largest bill that they pay. And I'm going to ask them to pay it on time every month and to do so without being hassled. Well, then I, I have an obligation then to make sure they have a clean, comfortable, modern place to live. And of course, this can be applied differently across the socioeconomic spectrum. But as you dig into a property, understanding one, the resident base that you're inheriting is incredibly important because these are honest to goodness communities. It's, it's been a while since I lived in an apartment, but I, when my wife and I first got married, we rented an apartment. Like I remember driving around, like, does my wife feel comfortable here? And you may see a business opportunity, but if you've got a community where uh, other residents who can afford that expense structure, aren't going to feel comfortable, you've got a significant problem. And just, hey, hey, I'm going to turn it over and lease it out. That's a very, very, re, we call that retenanting, exceptionally difficult. You've got to have a very gifted sales staff that can go sell new residents on a vision there. And then we tend to talk about it too, because uh, as anyone who's owned property knows, or just maybe I'm thinking about this because I'm looking at uh the mess my kids have made in our house, you can wear on property over time. And so if you've got a a resident base uh, that is really rough on your units, you're going to need to make allowances for that all the way down your P&L from a higher vacancy. And we can get to that in a second, uh, because obviously you're going to have higher turnover to get the people that you want. And it's going to take longer to fix and repair these units. And it's going to take longer to fix and repair because Residents who are rough on units, that does a lot of damage. And you can't just put new, despite what a broker may tell you, you can't just put new paint and carpet in and call it good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure you guys have uh, seen your fair share of, uh, you know, units that require a little bit of lipstick and other units that uh, you have to gut the unit down to the stud. So um, just, it's at the end of 20, it's at the end of January in 2024 right now. Um, where, where are we at right now from a market perspective, underwriting perspective, you know, are you still underwriting, you know, deals right now are, you know, how many deals do you typically underwrite before you see one that kind of, you know, passes your, you know, smell test or criteria, you know, what's, what challenges are you facing now? You know, what, what's kind of the horizon look like? Sure. So we are still active in the market. And it's certainly been difficult for a lot of the reasons that we've already talked about. You're seeing a higher expense structure. Uh, You're seeing in certain markets, a lot of new supply come online. That's a really important thing to make sure that your sponsor has accounted for in their underwriting, because that puts a lot of pressure on existing properties there. And then obviously, anyone who tells you they know what interest rates are going to be from six months from now with certainty is lying to you. Uh, We're we're in a very, very uncertain debt market. And that's uh, the largest portion of our capital stack in terms of how we put together these deals. And that frankly makes it difficult. Uh, We are still active because I do think that if you can go into a property with good fixed rate long-term debt, and say, all right, if I can cash flow here for five, seven, 10 years, 
then there's a business opportunity and you're not relying on rates to go back down there. It's frankly thinned the herd quite a bit uh, based on who still has the capacity uh, and propensity to go out and chase these types of opportunities. I'm not sure we're at the bottom yet. And I, I think and some people might hear that and say, well, does that mean you shouldn't be investing if you, you maybe I don't want to catch a falling knife? And I think the way you mitigate that is that you're always underwriting for cash flow, right? Like if I'm buying a deal right now, I need to see cash flow right out of the gate. Um, I say I don't know if we're at the bottom in terms of values changing just because of the sentiment there. I, I still see quite a few banks that are out there willing to lend. Uh, I still see a lot of excitement. Uh, around multifamily real estate. Uh, if I think back to, you know, 2010, 2011, like the first group of banks that we talked to about, hey, we're going to rent out this property. There was honest to goodness response from banks of, we don't think real estate will ever come back, right? Or I can't see anybody ever being able to pay rent for in that. I don't know if we're ever going to get past this unemployment. And I don't think we have to get there, but I think the sentiment is an important thing to watch, right? Like we should have seen in 2022 as... Uh, Everyone and anyone wanted to chase into real estate like, okay, things are getting a little frothy here versus now uh, and even further. Like when you start to hear people saying, ah, I'm really hesitant, that, that's when you, you might be sensing the bottom. But I believe real estate is still the best. I'm maybe biased doesn't mean I'm wrong. Uh, long-term investment if you're underwriting for cash flow. And so right now we are still putting out an offer, uh, I would say once every two weeks or so, uh, we have to see probably, we're probably going to look at 40 to 50 deals before, um, we get one under contract, uh, I would say. And there's a lot that we are able to look at quickly. Hey, the vintage, the location, no, doesn't work for us. Uh, and there's, there's plenty where we dig in, we do hours worth of work to really analyze and understand a property's ability only to find out that, Hey, you know, there was one we lost here because a 1031 buyer came in and was willing to pay all cash $750,000 above guidance. Like, I, I, I can't do that. Right. If this business was just as simple as go pay more, well, then anyone would do that, but that's not what we're in this for. We're in here. We're looking for cash flow. This is a this is a long term game, and you want to make sure that you've got long term strategies with it. Yeah, absolutely. What would you say, Matt, to that new investor, that investor that maybe has never invested before uh, passively into a real estate syndication? What would be maybe one or two things that you would encourage that individual investor to ask of the investment sponsor before? They make that decision to invest into that opportunity? I think that's a great question. Uh, I would say it's in many ways the guidance I give people who want to get started as a sponsor and being an active investor. You know, you, you want to be able to put some pretty good uh, lanes around your focus, right? So if you're going to invest, what asset type? Real estate is really broad, right? Self storage is much different than single family homes here. So asset type, location, because then uh, although you're going to be a passive investor, it's going to help you uh, really dial in the questions and your ability to understand. So, all right, where do I think that there is uh, strong returns? Where do I feel like I, I know markets? What asset types do I just have a general interest in is where I would start. Then as you start looking at sponsors, it's going back to track record, right? Tell me about what you've done in the past. Tell me about your experience with this business plan. Uh, tell me uh, about success stories, but tell me about failures in the past as well. Uh, anyone uh, who has owned a business again knows that not everything goes according to plan. And you want to be with someone who's had to be scrappy and to fight through difficult circumstances um, I'm reading a, a book right now, um, and I, I read his newsletter too. His name's Jared Dillian, and he talks about one of the scariest things in financial markets right now is if you go to most investment banks, like none of their senior leadership was around in 2008. So they, they just they just don't have an appreciation for what can happen. Um, so I say gray hair, or in my case, no hair, um, is a really valuable thing because you want to understand and you want to appreciate that this business is cyclical and you want people who have been through the ups and downs because that, that's what we've had to go through. It's not always up and to the right with super low 
interest rates there. So dial in on the person, dial in on the team. I'm always leery of a lone wolf show, right? Like you, you need, uh, you know, we're told seek counsel, even in scripture, right? Like you, you need people around you to provide uh, good guidance there and make sure that they have an identified core competency in terms of, look, they, they're truly an operator. They have property management in-house. They know this type of asset uh, and this is all that they do. So uh, that, that's kind of the mindset. And those are the questions that I would go after if I'm investing today. Yeah, that's great. I, I kind of, in my head, I like to kind of structure big themes around what people say. And I wrote down the three T's. The three T's as recommended by Matt are the sponsor's track record, uh, the team that they're surrounded with, and ultimately, you know, the time spent, you know, in the market, you know, versus always trying to necessarily time the market. So uh, those are great, uh, great three T's, Matt, that you called out there. Um, my next question for you, Matt, is, you know, what's, what's kind of next for, you know, Matt Bronner, Enduris Capital, um, you know, maybe it's you personally, you know, what's, what's kind of the next, uh, what's 2012 hold for you? Uh, 2024. Well, 20, by the way. I would say 2012. I had just met my wife, so <laughs> uh, and I had I had no kids at that point in time, so it's much much different. But um, I'm hoping to clear out what's behind me here as we um, finish our home, continue to put down roots. Uh, I'm very blessed to have four kids. We have a, an infant uh, who has just joined our family, so uh, just more time with family there. And I would say that carries forward into real estate, more of the same. Um, I would hope and pray and will work towards Endurance becoming more sophisticated and more focused. Uh, We have collectively uh, a lot of different experiences in real estate, but uh, I really want to dial in on specific product types. I want to continue to narrow our focus when it comes to the markets uh, that we're operating in. We've talked a lot about bringing property management in-house and we're continuing to work towards that. Uh, We could have a whole nother separate conversation there. No one uh, brings property management in-house just because they they want another three to 5% fee. It's you don't, you don't do property management for the money. You, property management is something you do to protect your investors' capital, and, and that's what we think is a really good opportunity for us there and something that we're exploring in that regard. We've got a couple of deals that are all hands on deck right now, and so we're working to make sure that we can get those uh, stabilized. So plenty to keep me busy, but uh, more time with family on the personal part uh, and then more sophisticated and more focused for Endurance. Yeah, well, congratulations on uh, on number four, and you've now officially caught up with me. So, congratulations! Just trying to be as cool as you, Jeremy. <laughs> Thank you, and um, Matt, I really appreciate you being you know on the show with us today. Uh, what would maybe be one or two different ways that our listening audience could connect with you or learn more about what you're up to? Sure. Uh, LinkedIn is a great place to find me, just Matt Bronner. And then you can also send me an email. It's Matt at Endurus Capital, E N D U R U S Capital, C A P I T A L dot com. Matt at Endurus Capital dot com. Great. Well, we'll certainly put those uh, links in the show notes. Again, Matt, really appreciate the value that, uh, that you brought our listening audience today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. You bet. And listening audience, thank you again for joining us on another episode of The Freedom Point. We look forward to having you join us on the next episode. Thank you for hanging out with us today and for listening to The Freedom Point Podcast, powered by Starting Point Capital. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Nothing said on this show should be considered financial advice. Before making any financial decision, please consult with a professional. This show is copyrighted by The Freedom Point Podcast. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting. If you're interested in connecting, you can find contact information at startingpointcapital.com.